know, I, that, that was the point I was trying to make. <laughs> well, anyway, good morning, everyone, and so forth. Uh, I was going to tell a Sabbath school class, we had uh, an elders meeting, when was it, Mark? Tuesday. Mark? Tuesday? And we talked about, you remember we have a little class, small groups thing, and so forth. So as soon as we think it is appropriate for, for the social distancing, we're going to go back to that, okay? Back to what? Back to our little class that we have over here. We'll still have the sanctuary for those. And uh, Mark has agreed to co-teach with me. Yeah. I, this is how he got it. <laughs> Yeah, and so forth. So Mark, we chose him because he can contradict everything I say the previous week, <laughs> and, and so forth. So anyway, uh, I'm uh, we, advocate. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's nice to have devil's advocate. Mark, it seems uh, like uh, it seems like all of them are. Yes, that's what you get for booking fun of me right there. I, I did. <laughs> the friendly and bright, I'm telling you. I like lapel mics because I used to have, wear a tie. Not looking at you for any particular reason, Robert, but uh, I used to use that for, you know, remember the little tie clasp you used to wear? And so forth, so, oh yeah, so. Hey, you know, we had a great lesson today because it's focused on one idea. Not 19 different things we try to cover in about 38 minutes. And so forth, so let's have a word of prayer and let's get in. I got some toughy questions and maybe they're not so tough, but they certainly should spur some discussion. And so among this group, it's almost guaranteed, and so forth. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we give thanks that we can come to the throne of grace. We're thankful for Jesus and everything he's done for us. Uh, how can we brag except to boast in the fact that you care for us and you're concerned about us, you paid a terrible price for us to be here today, and that we can actually grasp your salvation and have confidence in our eternal destiny. And we give thanks again, uh, of only words can express uh, for your help and assistance, for your sacrifice. We pray for your presence today, and we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with, <clears throat> to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's take a look at this text out of Isaiah 53. <clears throat> but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. That is not a past tense, or nor is it limited to the past. Would you agree? That is a statement that is limited is for all time, past, current, and future. When Jesus died on the cross, he made some words that said what? When he died on the cross, he made one very important statement before he died. It is finished, and yet we have some people who say, no, not quite. Not quite. I had a book here. Oh. Uh, this is called The Great Hope, and uh, it's a little handout, and by the way, uh, I'm on a committee about the Book and Bible House. You know, we have in trouble with our Book and Bibles across the country. Southwest Union, which is Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and so forth, closed all the Book and Bible Houses. When, as an Adventist, have you ever been in a situation where you felt that we would lose a book and Bible losses? Literature distribution, to me, is the right arm of the gospel's message. We came in, Carol and I, through literature. We read our way into the church. Right? And so forth. What would we be without it? Well, anyway, um, people aren't reading books anymore. That's part of the problem. People read periodicals, get to the point, and that's it. This is about as far as you're going to get. Most people, I have a book on Truman I wrote, the 932 pages. Most, most people I talk, 932 pages. Could we get a summary? <laughs> people are too busy to read and so forth. So uh, anyway, the yeah, thought is... Yeah, we spend three or four hours a day on our phones. That's true. That's the issue. That's really the issue. Uh, you know, you've heard of impulse buyers. Uh, you know what an impulse buy is, right? Somebody that says, I want the car now even though I can't pay for it. That's an impulse buy. Hi, Linda. Good to see you with us. Congress. <laughs> That's right. We'll impulse people. We want it now. I'm that way, right? 
You see something you like? I want it now. I don't want to wait four more years. I mean, if I, you know, if we didn't have mortgages, you would never have a house. And so forth. How long would it take to pay it off? Anyway, literature like this, a little piece like that, or Glow magazine, you know, the little Glow things you hand out. I want to just make a comment here, and then we're going to get into our lesson. Here's what it says. Some of the great hope. The great deceiver, this is going to follow what you just said about Matthew 24. The great deceiver has many heresies prepared to fit the different tastes of those he wants to ruin. His plan is to bring into the church insincere, unconverted people who will encourage, now listen to this, doubt and unbelief. Let's think about that for a minute. Doubt and unbelief is his major goal and objective for, to come, bring to us in the church. Right? Matthew 24 spends a lot of time, Jesus spent a lot of time on deceit. And he spent it on people who claim to be in Christ. Is that not? Many false prophets and many Christ will come, right? And will deceive many. If not possible, even the very elect would be deceived. So deception in Matthew 24 is a critical piece, okay, of last day events. Deceit. She goes on to say, Many who have no real faith in God agree to a few principles of truth and pass as Christians, and in this way they're able to introduce error as Bible doctrine. Satan knows that the truth. Received in love, okay, sanctifies the life. The truth, if it's not received in love, does not sanctify. Do you agree? That's a fabulous statement, and that's kind of where we're going to go today, uh, and so forth. So, anyway, this is a good little book. And uh, when I was traveling, I used to put it right on top of the Gideon Bible. Uh, when I was in the Hampton Inn or wherever, I just put it on top. I don't know what happened. Would they throw it away when they went through and pulled it out? I don't know. I never got the same room again. So I wasn't sure. It would have been nice. I should have asked for it, that type of thing. So anyway, all right, let's go. Isaiah 51 verse 2. This is what the Lord says. And he's talking about God's people, but especially talking about the time uh, on the northern and southern kingdom, and just by the time of their captivity, both the northern kingdom and the southern. It says this. This is what the Lord says. What, where is your mother's certification of divorce, with which I sent her away? A woman stands for a pretty woman, a good woman, a nice, you know, white woman, a nice gown, you know, carrying a white gown and so forth. We see her in Revelation. She's pure and so we represents the church. So he's really representing his people with this woman. And he says here, because of your sins you were sold, because of your transgression your mother was sent away. So we know that. We've been talking about that for 12 weeks or how many, is that because of the people's sin. Now, we've been trying to determine if so many people had went, went astray, what is it? How did that happen? Because it concerns me that it happens to us today. Why are we any different? And so forth. But, you know, with, you know, you know, we don't slay our children. We don't sacrifice them. I mean, some of the things they were doing, you know. I'm, I'm trying to get a grasp here. What can we learn from this? So let's go on here. It says, when I came, why was there no one? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Was my arm too short to deliver you? Do I lack the strength to rescue you? All right. What do you see in those texts? about why people walked away from God. What do you see there? Do we see doubt in those texts? Do you see any form of doubt there? Anything that being said here that people basically doubted, and that's because that's where they ended up. He said, do you doubt my strength to rescue you? Right? Something about these people. You know, I've been in sales and marketing for a long time. And I want to tell you right now. When we sell a product or a service, and you know, this is a transaction, by the way, Christianity. Jesus said, come and buy of me. Right? And so forth. He also said, count the cost. All of these things have to do with a buy and sell relationship. And so, what happens is, is people buy. Why do you buy something? Why do you purchase it? 
Okay, yeah. You have a need. Okay? Or a desire. Pardon? Or a desire. Yeah, well, you do, don't they kind of coincide? If you see the need and it's addressed by the product or service you're going to buy, it satisfies your desire, right? True? Okay. All right? So, the question to you and I is, is the gospel attractive enough to give you life to it? That's the gospel's pitch. Should we as Christians make the gospel attractive, or is it attractive on its own? It's got to be attractive on its own. Okay, it should be, because that's, that's the service, that's the product. That's the only basis that you're going to get to it and stay with it. Okay, all right. So, we're gonna, we've read stories both back and forth as we look at the book of Job. We'll talk about that in a minute. And other cases where we see that there is suffering in being a Christian. There is a struggle. Romans 7, Paul says, I have this struggle. He's talking about a current Christian walking through the process of sanctification. I struggle with this. The things that he asks, I cannot do. And Paul's going through this in Romans 7, and then he gives us a great answer in Romans 8. Yes, Linda. Okay. Okay. So you're talking about some assistance maybe in gathering in groups like we have today that we can kind of discuss the principles of Scripture. What Scripture is telling us not only about the gospel but the life of living the Christian. And we share our understanding of that because we all come from a different walk of life and we take that into the situation we live today and so forth. Well, okay. Did I... Did I basically summarize that right? Okay. Here's a question. Now, you may not think the question's accurate, and that's okay. Uh, that's why I made it an essay question. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Why is faith that leads to salvation and obedience, maturity in Christ, so difficult to obtain? Okay, is that a natural thing to want to do things our own way? Does that change after we're a Christian? Wanting to do it our own way. We get to an age, we move out of our parents' house for a reason. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> uh, yes, well, good, good point. I, I think you took me out of context. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the situation. Yeah, Mark, go ahead. I, I hope this is, is relevant to this, but I, I was reading this morning about uh, Jacob and how he was traveling back to his homeland, and he has the wrestling with, with the angel who we know is Jesus, and he gets the blessing. And he says, go, you know, I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry about it. And even after that, he still splits his caravan into two groups okay. and tries to take care of it his own way not knowing that at the very time of his wrestling, he was, God was also inspiring Esau with a dream, your brother's coming, and he helps him to kind of empathize with him a little bit more and don't harm him, and it was a wonderful embrace. But he just, even after that night of wrestling with Jesus, he still tried to take matters into his own hands. Okay. He had, he had to have some sense of control. Good and answer. human nature. Human nature, we are self-centered people. Okay, let me give you an example. George Knight was attending Andrews University. Everybody know who George Knight is? Okay, we should all know who George Knight is. Is he the only writer we got left? I don't know. But anyway, uh, he's out of Roseburg. He's, he's, uh, um, he's um, retired, but he taught at Andrews for many years, professor in theology and so forth. And he had a Muslim that was attending at Andrews. And, uh, and so, well, not a Christian man, but he was attending at Andrews. 
And he told George, he said, one night, and if George is listening, make sure I get this right, George. I won't take you out of context. But anyway, um, he went to this Baptist church, and they were having a baptism that day. And uh, do, bapt- do baptismas, it was a Southern Baptist church. Yes, they do. And so forth. So they had this guy up there, and he went under the water, he came back, and he said, this man has been born again. He is a new creation. And the Muslim says, wait a minute, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Well, you know, with the way he went in, the way he comes out, he still looks the same to me. He's still got the same wife, still got the same kids. What's different about him? And that's the issue today is maybe the reason, and probably the reason, that we have trouble giving an affirmative answer to this question is because we don't realize what sin really is. As some people say, we have atomized it. We take sin as being some form of an action that we do, and so we work to control the action. And so what we're going to do this morning first before we get into Isaiah 53 and those wonderful texts about Jesus' sacrifice, we're going to give you some impressions. What were the people thinking about God during the time of Isaiah's life? What were the people thinking when Jesus was here? They look like they're two different kinds of people, don't they? Wouldn't we consider the people of Jesus' day a very religious, God-fearing people? No, they were racist. (laughs) They're very racist. (laughs) Look how they treated the Samaritans. Well, that's true. (laughs) Of course, we even, now I have some of you know, in the the Adventist church, we had separation of lunches, black and white, up until 1952. That's right. Well, I'm giving them a break. <laughs> All right, you're right. The thing is, we look at Jesus' day, and this looked like a fairly religious people. And I don't mean religious from the standpoint, because you could look at, you know, Israel and Judea, where they were religious, but they were worship of other gods. It looked like this one, they were basically worshiping the real God, Jehovah, and so forth. And they would have a testimony, as Paul did, when it comes to righteousness in the flesh, I was infallible. That's what he said in Philippians chapter 2. You want to look at somebody who's following everything. I mean, every rule, every regulation. You look at me. And you know what he called it later, after we became converted? It was trash. It was awful. It did not lead me to a love in Christ. In fact, it led me to slay the very one who came to save me. That's scary. Yeah. Pardon? Or lead anyone else to Christ. That's correct. Well, they did have converts, right? What did Jesus say about the converts? There you go. We don't need converts like that. (laughs) That's right. Better not to have a convert. That's the case. Yeah. And that's George Knight language right there, right? That's the capital S and the little S. Yes, pretty much. <laughs> but you know, not only him, F. E. Bruce, John Stott, and on Adventist people, same thing. They agree with George, and George uses them back and forth as well. All right, well let's the reason we're asking this question, before we get into Isaiah. And what everything Jesus did for us and everything that he went through so that you could be saved, that was his goal, that was his objective. We need to know what these people were thinking. What was their perception of God? Now, is perception usually truth? Sometimes, sometimes not. Most people make decisions, I make decisions, and you make decisions based upon our perception of a very issue. You and I were having that discussion this morning. I perceive something, and sometimes it might be offensive. Mike might look at it, and he doesn't see it that way. Okay? He perceives it differently than I do. And so what we need to understand 
What Jesus went through won't mean a thing unless we have a right understanding of who God is. You don't have to be perfect in that. But how can you repent and come to the Lord if you don't even know him? How do you give your life to someone? Would you do that to anybody? You don't know him. Right? That's when Jesus said, you know, when he he turned the five virgins away, he said, I don't know you. What he was really saying is, you don't know me. Right? Right. Okay. Okay, here we go. Tough question. Jesus said that my burden is easy and my burden is light. Did he not? Now let's read this one. Enter through the narrow gate. Now remember we're talking about the attractiveness of the gospel. Now we're going to read this text. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. That's a little scary, isn't it? If the gospel is that good, if it is that attractive, why is it that people most will reject it? That's a question we need to be able to answer. You're giving your life. You know, when pastor gets up there and gives his message, when we go out and do missions and so on, we're giving our life to a cause. That means everything. There was a song called, Love Me With All Your Heart. Uh, It was sang many years ago, Engelbert Humperdinck. We need to change his name. Uh, And so forth. And he sang this song. And I thought, what a great gospel song this is. It was a love song. But you know many love songs come from a gospel background. Give me all your heart. That's all I ask. Love me with all your heart. How does that go, the rest of it? Love me with all your heart. And it says, oh, uh, Love me with all your heart, or don't love me at all. That is a gospel thing, is it not? Laodicea is what? Luke 1. Give me all your heart, or not at all. Either we get in with both feet, or we stay out. Because you can't be in between. Full commitment can't be halfway, right? All right. Any comment on this? What do you think about when you read this? Bob? Well, God, God is a particular God. He says his way is easy and his burden is light. But if you try to insert your own ideas and thoughts and feelings in there and not let him be 100% in control, then it is not light. Okay, Bob's on to something here, all right? The burden of being a Christian is carried by who? Jesus, and that is not the case sometimes with us as Christian people. We try to carry the burden. What happens when we carry the burden? Who directs our actions? Who directs our thoughts? We do. We oftentimes paint a pretty ugly picture of God in other people's see. And we do. How many of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, have been times when we say, I was a terrible example for what a Christian should be? Yeah. We don't experience the power of God. We become like the ten tribes that said, hey, it's a great land, but we can't take it. Okay. Isn't that, that's a wonderful truth. Because God says, look, when you're in a time of difficulty, I'll walk with you. That's what he says. And he said, any man that cometh unto me, I won't cast him out. Come to me with your issues. See my power in your life. I don't care if it's a meeting you're going to tomorrow and you think, I don't know, am I ready for this? Can I, you know, or you're afraid of something that's going to happen. When you're at the throne of grace, you talk to him about it. Help me with this. And you know, when you do that, you'll start having daily, daily examples of God's power in your life. It's the little things in the Christian life that prepare us for the big things that we'll have to address later. Isn't that true? And so I want an experience every day where I see Jesus in my life. How about you? Okay? And so forth. And if you say, I don't know if I'm having that, sometimes it's because we never think about it. Right? That's why we need testimony services. So that you can get up and say, and keep testimony short. Robert uh, has a a very short attention span. And so forth. So we got to keep it short. 
get up and tell him, and it should be recent, what Jesus has done for you. It might be that meeting we just talked about. So I saw him act. I saw the results of that. And every time you give a testimony, it helps you to remember what God has done for you. When we don't think about it, we forget it, and so forth. Testimony services are meant to brag about God. That's what a testimony is. It has nothing to do with you and me, except for the fact we've experienced his grace, right? All right, let's take another one. This is in John 1, 11. He came to his own people. And what does it say? But his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The wonderful thing about faith is, when Jesus died on the cross for you and me, he basically said, if you accept that sacrifice in your life, he said, well, that's too easy. But that's what it is. He said, I'm going to give you a number of things as a gift. First of all, you have a right to be in my family. He said, you have a right to be there. Okay, number two, he forgives us of all of our sins. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means there is no judgment of eternal death if you are in Christ. Agree? Now, if we know that, not because we're so good, but because he is, it'll give us a foundation where we can grow. That's what Ellen White was talking about when she said, accept the truth in love. We accept Jesus because of his love for us. If we don't accept the basic premise that he has forgiven you, and you know that if you were to die today, without a doubt, because you trust him, that you're all right. He will welcome you at his second coming. And so forth. If we don't have that, we can't share anything. Is that true? All right, let's go on. Now, let's talk about the people in Isaiah's day. I think I showed this slide before. This was what they were like. Let's take a look at it. This is taken from Prophets and Kings, page 311. Not a compilation, by the way, Dan, as you probably know, uh, and so forth. In Isaiah's day, the spiritual understanding of mankind was dug through misapprehension of God. Didn't understand him, okay? Long had Satan sought to lead men to look upon their creator as the author of sin, suffering, and death. Those whom he had thus deceived imagined that God was hard and exacting. Where are you at there? Do you think God is hard? Do you think he's exacting? Every little thing you do or don't do, he's got his eyes looking to see if you make a mistake. Is that your picture of God? Is that how you see him? Have you heard people give that description of God? In the church or outside? Nitpickers. Always looking to see if you're following everything that's, you know, been spelled out. So the impression is that I better be very careful how I walk. If you had good parents, and I trust all you have, not perfect parents, but good parents, I never walked on eggs when I was a kid. How about you? I felt comfortable within my family. Now, you may have not had that experience. Okay, I did. And my parents were far, far from perfect. They weren't even Christian people. But I felt comfortable in my family. I knew that as life went, I made mistakes. I did things either deliberately or not. I always knew that I was still part of the family. There was always certain regulations that we had as part of that family in order so that we could all exist together and survive together and prosper together. Right? But I never had the fear, okay, that when I made a mistake or I slipped, that I was out the front door. How would a person live like that? How can you have an experience in a family with that always in the back of your mind? 
Now, yes, I know you had to say something, Dan. Please do. My father looked for excuses to beat me. Yeah, you had a different experience, yeah. Okay, now th I'm glad you brought that up because we judge God by our own experiences in life. If we've had a difficult experience in a family, we look at God that way, right? Uh, Mark, go ahead. But it, just to capitalize off that, I, I think another aspect too is sometimes with our words, we say in ignorance things that we think are going to be comforting or give people faith. And we say things like, oh, it, it, it was God's will. God's will for you to be beaten within an inch of your life? No. Was it God's will for a 12-year-old girl to be raped by her father? No. no. We have to have an understanding of the great controversy. Yeah. And that sin does have to play itself out. And that God is, he doesn't intervene every time. You know? And it's just, it's, it's hard for us to understand, but the a healthy perception of the great controversy helps, I think, to put things into perspective. And uh, I think without that, that's another way that we, we paint a very scary picture of God. Yeah. He, he willed bad things to happen. No, he did not. And I think Jesus that's why. Said, you know, in, in, in the Lord's Prayer, um, you know, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because his will is not being done on earth. Right. Exactly right. Good point. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that because we all come from different backgrounds. Mark and I were talking about that this morning. We look at things through the tunnel of the life that we have lived. And so some people look at things differently. And so when we look at God's grace, and what we're going to talk about a little more today, I'm going to move this a little faster, is the fact that God went, Jesus went through a lot for us because he loved us. He wants us to be saved. His goal is not to turn us away. God is for us all the way through this. It's only us that makes that decision. But how we perceive God's importance. So let's go back to this. They regarded him as watching to denounce and condemn, unwilling to receive the sinner so long as there was a legal excuse for not helping him. The law of love by which heaven is ruled had been misrepresented by the arch deceiver as a restriction upon men's happiness, a burdensome yoke from which they should be glad to escape. If you're going to sell a service or a product, it has to be attractive. Not to meet the needs of me when I'm witnessing to someone, but to meet the needs of them. We never assume a need. We're always going, well, he needs the Savior. How do you know? Did you talk to him? Is that his opinion? We should have a little different thought process. We should go in with people and say, look, I'm not going to push the gospel on you, but I'd like to talk to you about certain things that are going on. And you can have that general discussion with people. I had that two or three weeks ago. A non-Christian person saying the world's in a mess. And that opened up to, eventually we got to what I do. And I said, well, I go to church on, on you know, uh, in the weekend. <laughs> Didn't want to bias the guy. Finally, said, we had to go to church on Sunday. Why do you go to church? I said, because I'm in the same boat you are. The world's an absolute mess, and there's got to be a better solution. And I found out there was. The end result was that another guy come by. He's a Christian with another denomination, but they have a prayer session together once a week. They ask me if I attend. I am going to attend that. This guy's going too. You see where that conversation went? I didn't tell him what his need is. He expressed his need. And then we can think about what we think might be a good solution. 
the gospel to be made attractive. I want to do more of that, uh, and all of us can do that, uh, but we need to have and have faith in God that he's made a promise to you that if you accept him, you're part of the family now, and you want to invite more people in, and then use that to grow and do every issue that comes up, whether it's sin in your life, whether it's problems at work, whether it's a relationship at home, you take it to the throne of grace. When people say, well, I don't know if I could take five minutes. Forget the five minutes. Talk about anything you need to talk about at the throne of grace and stay there until you're finished. And you should do that in your closet with the door shut. That's where intimacy begins. You agree? And so forth. So, all right, let's go on. Now, let's go to Jesus' day. What was the problem with these people? This comes, again, from George Knight in his book, Sin and Salvation, a fabulous, fabulous book. It's not real long. If you get a chance to buy it, you should. Here's what he says. The central problem in the dominant tradition of Pharisaic Judah's approach to God and salvation was an inadequate view of sin and its effect on human ability. Okay? Think about that. They had an inadequate view of what sin is for so long. And Ellen White once said, you know, we've talked the law so, long, so much that it's as dry as the bones of Balboa. What she was saying is, is that what we haven't been talking about is what sin really is and why we are so inadequate and able to address it. Because sin is an internal issue. Isn't that true? Didn't he say it's a fair issue? You really look good on the outside, but inside you are bad news. Paul was bad news, even though he said, when it comes to the law and righteousness, I'm infallible. And he was sincere. He meant that. But there was something wrong. He had an inadequate view of God. And what did it lead? What does an inadequate view of God lead? To slaying the Savior. All right, let's go on. The rabbinic uh, perspective came to view sin generally as a specific act rather than a condition of the heart and the mind. Likewise, the dominant Pharisee tradition was neither, was neither Adam or, or his descendants as morally different because of the Genesis fall. They believed that we have the same disposition, the same abilities that Adam had before the fall. Do you agree with that? That's what they believed. The fact is, we don't. But they believed we did. So if, if Adam could live a life of perfection, how many think Adam was righteous before the fall? All right. They said, well, if he can do it, we can do it. That was their attitude. So that's a little bit different than the attitude of those in the time of Isaiah. Isaiah. In other words, human beings since the fall have had the ability to live the righteous life as Adam did before it. Not true. Okay? But that's what they believed. And that's why they had such a difficult time accepting Christ. The essence of the Pharisee problem is viewing the nature of sin as being a series of acts rather than being primarily a condition of a hard and rebellious attitude toward God. Very quickly, the rich young ruler... What about him? When, Jesus, when he asked Jesus, well, what am I supposed to do to be saved? Apparently, and this was a good Christian man, we might say. He was good. When he said, I've kept the law from the very beginning. Jesus didn't contradict his answer. Externally, he was a Paul in his day. Looked close to infallible to us. And then Jesus said this. Remember when Ellen White said, the truth received in, what was the word? Love. He had received what he thought was truth, but not in love. And so Jesus reached out to him, and he said basically this. Sell everything you've got. Why? Because his money was his God. He didn't realize that, but it was. And we know that because he said, sell everything you have and come and join me. And what did he do? He walked away. Maybe that's the reason why people don't accept the gospel, okay? He walked away because his foundation of his faith was not based on what would? Love. 
He wasn't suing God because what God had done for him, because he really didn't think God did anything for him. Salvation was something, if I do enough good to offset the bad, I'm in there. His focus was not on that. That was his focus, you're saying. Jesus said, no, 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 I got it wrong. You need to change from within, and you can't do that on your own. You're going to need me to help you with that every day, right? And so forth. All right, so let's go on. I have at least an idea of what Jesus was dealing with. Now, let's go to Isaiah. This is wonderful. For you have delivered my soul, and this is talking about Christ now. For you have delivered my soul from death, and deep my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of the living. This is talking about Jesus. Who did Jesus depend on when he lived in this earth? God. Now, let me ask you something. When Satan tempted him and said, you know what, uh, why don't you turn those stones into bread? Do you think he could have done that? So what was his temptation? The doubt, if you are. Okay, that's part of it. Satan knew he could. But what he was trying to do, Jesus was trying to live a life the way you and I need to live it. Dependent on God. The difference is, Jesus had the power because he was God. And so Satan knew he could do it. There was no doubt there. But he was putting doubt in Jesus' mind. If you're the son of God now, Jesus knew he was, turn these stones into bread. What would have been Jesus' problem if he'd have done that? What was a major frac I should say, fracture of, of what he was trying to obtain if he'd have turned those stones into bread? No sin in turning stones into bread. What would have been the issue there? Pardon? Okay, but there's something beyond that. He was using his power. What's our problem? Using our power. Jesus had to show us we can depend on God. That's what's saying here, right? Yes, Mark. I think another aspect is that he would have been using his power for him and love is other than All right, so now this part of it. Did you hear that? To be using his power for him, to bring attention to him. Okay? So everything we do that we fight in life, that's why Paul was counseled, fight the good fight of faith. There is a fight going on every day in our lives. It doesn't go away because you were baptized. You're the same old guy, right? But you have a different thought. You have a different direction. You've accepted a whole different situation. And by faith, as little as it is, I'm now part of the family of God. I now have no condemnation in God's eyes. Legally, I am, I am look, I'm being looked at as, by God as a man who has never sinned in his life. It's quite a gift, isn't it? God looks at you and he says, oh, yep, perfectly righteous. Why? Because Jesus was righteous. You don't think we can give that testimony? It's wonderful, but you have to believe it. And that will give you the motivation to grow. Agree? And I think sometimes, too often, the reason we have trouble growing is we don't really believe that we have a saving relationship with Jesus. Because we are not there yet. We still have imperfections, and so forth. If we don't have that, and you get it by asking for it, seeking it, how can we even share anything about God? Because we don't believe what he said. Unbelief is not accepting God's promise to us. As bad as it is as breaking the Sabbath or anything else, believe, not believing that he can give us that gift because we're not worthy. There's no hope. All right, let's go on. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Why does God want us to have an attitude of saved to begin with. When does that text hang it? Let's look at it again. For we are God's handiwork, created in Jesus Christ to do good works. Created in Jesus Christ means becoming part of him, accepting his grace. Then he says, do good works, because our foundation is love. Our hope and power is in him. Anything that God asks us to do, I can take to the throne of grace. And that's where the real test comes in. Show me your glory in that prayer. Let me see you work this out in my life. In 
And when he does, you've got something to say. You've got a testimony to give. And so this was the problem with the Jews. We are so self-centered, we don't want any help. Right? It's me or nothing. I think I said that to Kill, and she broke up with me for about six months. No, I didn't it. Is it? <laughs> it's me or nothing, right? That's, that's not a good thing. <laughs> okay. Let me ask you this question. A question for a question. Paul says in Romans 7 that we have a bent to sin. All right? And it says that because of one man's sin, sin spread to all men. Did you have any, did you have any opinion on I mean, did you have anything to say about that? Or were you just, were you just born that way? You're just born that way, right? And so forth. And so we have this bent to sin. It's easy for us to sin. It's easy for us to do our own thing. It's hard for us to follow God's way. In fact, I'll tell you right now, downright impossible. Unless we come to Jesus and say, you know what? You might even say, I like this that I'm doing. But I know it's not your way. And I need you to help me with desire as well as to give me the power to overcome it. He will You'll be so surprised if you haven't experienced. He will do that. How do you, I mean, how does he do that? You have not only a change in attitude toward that, but you have the power to actually step out and do it. That's what we all want to be, right? We want to see God in our lives. And so forth. That's what this whole idea about Isaiah, that's what God was, what Jesus went through for us is so that we'll learn to rely on him from day one. As you first came to Jesus, what does it say? So walk in him, right? Now, lastly, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He said, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses theirs, right, you will not certainly enter the kingdom of heaven. What he was saying is, if you're depending on yourself, and have trust in yourself that you're righteous, you're in trouble. But if your hope is in me for your righteousness, you're in good hands. And not with all state, with Jesus, right? Yeah. I was going to say another word that you just said, but basically our righteousness is Christ's righteousness. That's right. Okay. I won't go into that. This is really good, but I would say this. Uh, we just don't have the time. Uh, let's move on. It's a good point, but I, we need to go on. Remember, there is no condemnation for those of you who are in Jesus. That's his promise. Paul makes it very clear. That gives us confidence to step out and to work very hard in his power to become more like him. Right? Okay. Let's take a look at this. We'll have to close here. The sovereign Lord, this is part of our lesson today, has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. The Father gave him that. He keeps going back to the Father. He wakens me by morning. What happened? I think, I think Pastor Dave did that. I don't know, but maybe. He wakes me by morning. My morning wakes my ear to listen like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face, mocking and spitting. What was he talking about? This is talking about our Lord and Savior Jesus. What was he talking about? What he went through, okay, in order for you and I. And I just dropped something. All right. It's telling me to stop. Uh, we didn't get through everything. But lastly, the Bible does tell us that life's difficult, even as a Christian, right? What about people who aren't Christians? Is life difficult for them, too? For the most part, yeah, it is. The difference is, is we, first of all, number one, we have the assurance of salvation. Number two, we know that even though problems may come, because we live in Satan's world today, he's called the prince of this earth. We are in the, to take your words, the theater of the universe. And there are a lot of spectators. 
and most of them are not from here. You see, the damage that sin can do if we understand what sin really is, is that if God is not in control, we can't expect success, not because God is punishing us, because when you separate, you from, separate yourself from life, you experience what? Death. So, but here's the grand thing. What is the end result of Jesus' sacrifice? Bud, we have two right. Okay, salvation, but what else? saying that Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient. When he said, it is finished, it was finished. It was finished. There's no more to do. Certainly he's our high priest in heaven because he continues to intercede for us. Okay? And so forth. Thank goodness for that. So, uh, we didn't get through everything, but the real thing is in Revelation chapter 5, Jesus has died, he's been resurrected, He's went to heaven. And John is looking up into heaven. And it is quiet. And there is a book that sits on the throne of grace at the left hand or the right hand side of the Father. It's a scroll. And the word comes out who is worthy to open the scroll? Or to break the seals, actually, is what it says. That book is the testimony of Jesus' actions for us throughout history to bring us salvation. Who is worthy to open that up? Not one word is said. Not even the Father says anything. Nobody says, and John starts weeping because his salvation's at stake. If nobody can open that book or that scroll, you and I might as well leave the place right now. And then he says, I seen a lamb as if it had been slain. And he came and he sat down and picked up the scroll. And all of heaven said, he is worthy to open the scroll. Friends, Jesus is worthy for what he did for us. That he, we can count on him for our salvation. The difference is, stay attached. Have we heard that before? Jesus said, your job now is this. Stay attached to the vine. As long as I'm feeding you, you will grow. You will become a Christian of Christians. And that's, that's the attractiveness of the gospel, is it not? Even when it's difficult in the world, we have a place we can go. We have someone who will understand, and we will have the assurance of his love for us as long as we want it. Let us pray. Father, we give thanks again for Jesus and his love. What a wonderful story of what Jesus has done for us. It's so hard sometimes that we fail to remember this able to bring it into our minds. But it was a great sacrifice. We pray that you'll help us also to have an experience every day in every little thing that we do, that we see you walking ahead of us, providing the grace that we need and giving us a testimony that we can share with others. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you very much.